Good morning. Welcome to all of you who didn't get the memo that Pastor James would be out of town and would not be here to take roll today. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Brad, your, your substitute preacher for the day. I have absolutely no awareness of what announcements are important, but you all saw them scrolling across there, so I think we'll just plan on getting started. So um, the, the only thing is, I have been substituting for so many COVID people in the last couple of months <clears throat> that I can't remember when you stand up and sit down and do all your kneeling. It just gets way too confusing, so do that on your own, if you would, please. <laughs> I'm not going to mention it anymore. So let's begin, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join please in the singing of the entrance hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Most holy God, the earth is filled with your glory, and before you angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world, and by your grace make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson is from the sixth chapter of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting high on a throne, high and lofty, and then the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of his people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and the houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like the terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump, the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I turn had received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, last of all to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they. So we proclaim, and so you have come to believe, the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Sisters and brothers in Christ, may the grace and peace of God be yours in abundant measure. Amen. If you um, happen to be in the market for good advice as to where the fish are biting, the steenstra to whom you must turn is not me. It is my cousin Tom, who was the outdoors writer for the San Francisco Chronicle uh, until he retired. I'm a, a different sort. Somewhere in my closet is a belt embroidered with all of the game fish of Minnesota so that on the off chance that one of them would have accidentally jumped into the boat, I could recognize them. I am uh, the veteran of so many fishing expedition flops throughout the years that I have learned well that it can come to be a real trial of your patience. There are just so many things that can go wrong and spoil your day. You might happen to drop anchor in what proves to be a really bad spot. You might cast your line continually where it gets snagged and breaks when you try to reel it in. The fish might not be in the mood to taste whatever bait you are dangling to entice their appetites. Or they might turn out to be smarter than the one who is holding the pole. That's why even after a full day's session at a trout farm, I have been known to go home with nothing but a lot of frustration. But after hearing today's gospel, I don't feel as sorry for myself. Because hearing about that forlorn group of professional anglers who had spent a long night out on the water trying to make a living in their costly business where every single step of the venture was subject to burdensome taxes, it helps me to know that they too could come up empty. I have a good excuse for my series of empty stringers because I am clearly a rank amateur with no clue about what I'm doing. But those guys are experienced experts and they still fail. They catch the same thing I do, zilch. 
yet remarkably unlike me, they don't whine over those horrible results. They don't seem to be looking for any sympathy. Apparently, not only have they dealt with this kind of futility many times before, they also can reasonably expect that this will not be the last time they haul in an empty net either. Dry spells simply go with the territory when you make your home in a waterfront community where your livelihood is based solely on netting, preparing, and selling fish that are forever elusive. Out on the often treacherous lake, six times a week, they have grown accustomed to having to wait for their small successes. They are fully aware that much of human life exists between the hard work and the results. Many times, there's nothing to be done but to accept that the kitchen table will be bare today. You might as well just strip the weeds off the nets so that you can go out the next night to repeat the same familiar procedures as before. Always operating with the hope that your luck will change for the better. But on this occasion, it proves to be a little different. An itinerant rabbi named Jesus shows up. Seeing that Simon and his friends aren't busy cleaning fish for market, he asks if they would row him out on a short path from the shore so that he can teach the crowd that has followed him to Capernaum. Perhaps glad for the diversion from the misfortune weighing on their spirits, and despite their weariness, they consent. They listen in as the preaching of Jesus stirs up excitement among the people. He announces the coming of the reign of God that will overturn the corrupt social structures in which they are trapped and mend the brokenness permanently. He invites them to repent and join the movement toward this new day, a message that appeals to all who hear it, including the frustrated fishermen. Then, perhaps wanting to repay the kindness that has been extended to him, as well as to illustrate his teaching in a concrete way, Jesus urges Simon to move the boat further out from the shore into the deeper waters of the lake where chaos is assumed to rule and put down the nets there for a catch. Something that makes absolutely no sense to these seasoned fishermen. They have spent the entire previous night in much better locations casting their nets and hauling them back in empty. All of these fruitless efforts have resulted in assembling enough evidence to convince them that their old era view of the way things are must surely be true. It would just be a further waste of time and energy to try again in a less likely spot since repeating the same failed strategy and expecting a different outcome is the very definition of insanity. While none of them had ever ventured under the surface of the water themselves on purpose, all the data they had assembled while parked on top of it throughout the hours of the darkness caused them to conclude they knew exactly what was going on down there regardless. Absolutely nothing. Yet for some unknown reason, they obey. In the face of an unpromising situation, in spite of believing that the conditions are unchanged apart from the presence of Jesus with them in the boat, 
They humor the teacher and do what he says they should do anyway. They let down their nets in the too deep water, only to find that this time their practiced exercise of their ancient craft produces an astonishing result. Contrary to all conventional wisdom, it is not too late for them to know success. Suddenly there is a huge school of fish swimming beneath them and surging right into their nets, almost yanking them into the lake. Apparently, all of these finny friends of Nemo are as interested in drawing near to the one who is the Lord of all creation as are the humans that had crowded around him on the beach. Both have congregated as close as possible to where Jesus is. And there they are caught up in the net of God's superabundant grace. Not only are the heavens full of the glory of the Lord, but it seems that when Jesus, the powerful word that gives shape to the universe, is present, so too is both the land and the sea. This carpenter's son from Nazareth is the one who makes the rules for the lake, not the emperors of Rome. The greatly surprised men in the boat are blessed with such an excessive catch of fish that their nets, made of the same kind of flimsy materials from the old age that pair up so perfectly with their old era thinking, cannot handle the weight and begin to break. They frantically signal their partners to come and help them deal with this unimaginable bounty. And so many fish ultimately get hoisted over the sides of both boats that the heavy load puts them in danger of sinking. Even worse, being in such close proximity to this unexpected display of what is surely a heavenly power is so amazing as to be frightening. Simon drops to his knees at the feet of Jesus afraid that as a sinful person he is about to be liquidated, consumed in the holiness of the epiphany of the Lord. But Jesus speaks a word that first calms this fear and invites them all to join in, in the new reign of God with him, where this kind of bounty can be enjoyed by everyone not just the elite. And where ordinary fishermen like them have the chance to use the skills they have learned in doing more of this kind of catching, but with people instead of fish. So when they get back to solid ground, instead of taking advantage of this miraculous once-in-a-lifetime haul to set themselves up for more of the same old thing they have always done to survive, they leave it all. Fish and nets and boats, right where it is. And without looking back, they hit the road with Jesus as his disciples. I wonder what it would take for us present day listeners to do anything close to that dramatic. To be so moved by the difference, the presence of Jesus in the midst of a small group of Lutherans like this can make that we could never go back to being the same dispirited, pandemic weighed down people we were when we walked in here this morning. To be so swiftly absorbed in the abundant grace of Emmanuel, God with us, 
that we would want nothing more than to help individuals, households, and entire neighborhoods get caught up with us in moving towards the values and practices that are liberating alternatives to the ones that prevail in the world as we have come to know it. To be so surprised by the Lord's word that when he instructs us to do something simple that to our eyes not only seems completely unpromising but well into the category of never going to happen, not merely improbable but impossible, we would let down our nets anyway into the chaos that surrounds us just because that ordinary act is what he asks us to do. To be that willing when the bounty that we wouldn't dare to expect mysteriously materializes, to partner with other nearby assemblies of believers so that together we were actually able to do a better job of hauling in everything that gets caught in the nets of God's unfathomable mercy. What would it take for that to happen to us? Believe me, as I said at the beginning, I know how easy it can be to grow discouraged when you have been fishing in the same way and in the same spot for a long time without anything to show for your trouble. Especially if you are just sitting around waiting for something to accidentally jump into the boat. But thankfully I also know what it feels like to be swept up into the net of God's grace after Jesus shows up to change the prevailing circumstances for the better and to invite us to be participants with him on the adventure that follows. Just hanging around church can be both unproductive and mind-numbingly boring. But being obedient to what you hear can turn out to be the most exhilarating thing you've ever done. Nothing else you might try can offer you the instantaneously reinvigorating excitement that comes with the invitation to go out from this place and help others to be caught up in the joy brought into the world by its Savior. All you have to do is faithfully trust that when he brings that what he brings with him is indeed a brand new day and say yes when he asks you to give following him your best shot. Then you will discover the wonder that with God's call not only is there always a catch there is no limit Amen. The hymn is uh, number 414.
Please join me in the confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together let us join our hearts and pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Ever surprising God. It was as hard for the first disciples to imagine fishing for people as it is for most of us to think about switching to a career of mining Bitcoin. But somehow they found the courage to follow Jesus anyway. So we ask you to equip us in the same way now. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon the people you have called to be your church in this time and place that we too might be moved to take the risk of sharing with others the good news that we have first received. The forgiveness and mercy shown to us through your son, Jesus. Send us out as apostles to our community, sharing the hope of your salvation with those who need the relief you promise in your new age. Holy God of hosts, Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. You reveal your splendor in fiery sunsets and in the stars that send their lights to us from deep space. Teach us to look for and recognize you in the beauty of our natural world and move us to treat it with the great care it deserves. Soften the hearts of rulers and governments particularly those in the nations that seem to enjoy flaunting their authority, so that they commit themselves to recognizing and tending first to the needs of their citizens. Ease the current tensions in the hot spots around our globe, particularly in places like Ukraine and the Korean Peninsula. Remove corruption and the impulse toward violence everywhere and put your hand of protection on first responders and military personnel everywhere who are putting their lives at risk in service of others. We know that your steadfast love endures forever and you will not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Bless doctors, nurses, therapists, social workers, and all caregivers who have given so much of themselves during this pandemic. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, or in any pain, especially those who are on our hearts this morning. The disciples received the help of partners as they struggled to bring in that abundant catch of fish. So strengthen the alliances we have forged with community organizations and ministries like Robin's Nest and Family Promise. Multiply our shared efforts and bring joy to our relationships. And as always, we pause to give thanks to you for our ancestors in faith who boldly answered your call. Give us courage like theirs to trust you and to give witness to your mercy until the day that you gather us into your glory. Since we have great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you 
in confidence that you hear them and answer them through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Have some back there. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'm going to read my part and spare you any ear bleeding, but I encourage you to sing your response. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending
We remember how in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet for all is now ready. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. I'll wait until the end.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. to stand you up to receive the benediction. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.